This is block four over there, section four, Pershing and the EEF, the section starting with Ferdinand Foch. This is Ferdinand Foch. He is French. Uh, he is named the commander of all of the Allied forces on the Western Front uh, in the last year of the war, and that was quite a big job. That if you look at the map, and you, what we have here, this is Germany, see Germany, this is France, and this red line, this red line that you see that I am now covering with a black line, this red line is the line of trenches. On one side, up here in the north, you have the British. Down here, you have the French. And the Americans were going to be put uh, into this middle section between the French and the British. And Ferdinand Foch was in command of the entire front. British, French, and American uh, were all reporting to General Foch, or a Marshal, Marshal Foch. It's worth talking for a few minutes about how World War I ended. So that's what we're going to do uh, by having a look at this map. Do everything with the trench lines. I think that's what that's done. Nope. Uh, All right. Germany has one last chance to win the war in 1918. They remember, they have gone to war with the United States. They have established unrestricted submarine warfare uh, with the attempt. They knew the Americans were coming in, but they said they were going to strangle Britain and win the war before Americans could arrive in France in force. They also had knocked the Russians out of the war in the east, and the Russians were undergoing their big old civil war, as we've seen. That allowed the Germans to bring troops from the eastern part of Germany across to this western front that has been stalemated and deadlocked since the summer of, since the fall of 1914. It is now the summer of 1918. And this red line, this red line that we saw, has pretty much been the front line for the entire war. Hundreds of thousands of men die for acres of land. Tiny little, you know, bumps in the line are fought over with the lives of hundreds of thousands of young Frenchmen, British, and Germans, uh, along with their colonial uh, native armies as well. Germany imagines that it has one last push. And in this one last push, the Germans' goal is to conquer Paris. If they can just conquer Paris before the Americans get there in force, they can dictate terms and win the war successfully. So in a summer, um, in an offensive in the summer of 1918, what color, let's do the Germans in red. In the summer of 1918, the Germans, one more time, with all the strength they have left, attack the trench lines, aiming towards Paris. Soldier for soldier, by 1918, the Germans are in better shape than the British and the French, and they actually do manage to start pushing the lines back. Um, there are trenches dug behind the main trenches, so the British and the French, they get out of their trenches, they retreat, they go to a second line of trenches. The Germans are developing, though, a tactic uh, using storm, what they call stormtroopers, elite troops to attack first, break through the line, and then have that opening exploited by the rest of their soldiers. And for the first time in years, there are actually now German troops advancing on the French capital of Paris. There are not enough American troops in France yet to make a huge difference. And after four years, Paris is again threatened. The first time American troops are going to make their weight felt is at the Battle of saint Michel, which is up around here, uh, in the northern outskirts of Paris. And literally, American troops were taken off of trains directly to the fighting. There was simply not enough British and French troops left uh, to check this German advance in any major way. So at the Battle of saint Michel, which was a part of this whole Second Battle of the Marne, was the first time that American troops operated independently. And American divisions were put into the line, they were put into the Allied line between the French and the British to check this German advance. American troops prove their worth, and they do very well under fire, and take heavy, heavy casualties. Um, but, with 
Every day, 10,000 more American troops were arriving. And these were simply not numbers that the Germans could keep up with. They're at the bottom of their barrel also. Every day, there are 10,000 new American troops in the line. The Germans gambled, and their gamble came very close to paying off. But in the end, with these American troops arriving, the German army, their attack stalled. This was the Second Battle of the Marne. And the Americans at the Battle of saint Michel, up here north of Paris, helped stop the German advance. If you can see on the map, you should be able to, there is kind of this red line. After the German advance was stopped, this was the new front line. This was where the German trenches were now. And you can see this red line. This is kind of the emergency German line. It's called the Hindenburg line, named after their great general, General Paul von Hindenburg. This is the line of last defense for Germany. It is not actually in Germany. It is still in France. And that is going to play a big thing, a big role when it comes to Hitler and all of that stuff with Hitler. But now in the fall of 1918, the Germans have shot their bolt. They're done. Everything they had was in that last offensive at Paris, and it failed. It stalled. And now with 10,000 more American troops from, uh, arriving every single day, the Allies felt that they were in a position to do some counterattacking of their own. And that is um, the Meuse Argonne Offensive. The Meuse Argonne Offensive, and I'm going to use blue for this one, the Meuse Argonne Offensive is an enormous um, uh, Allied assault all along the German line. Coming in this, the first goal is to kind of cut off this salient here. American troops help do just that. And then the weight of numbers finally started to tell. For the first time in years, the front actually starts to move. New Allied weapons, like tanks, and if we can get my computer assistant, Google for me a World War I tank. Tanks are used in warfare for the first time uh, in World War I. They start in 1916. There's it, that's not a World War I. That's, that's a German World War I tank. See if, no, that's, that's 1926. Give me, there, there's one. There's one, there's one, there's one. This one right here. That's a good color one. This is a British World War I tank. It is a big old monstrosity. Um, you notice right off the bat, it does not have the giant gun on it that we expect from modern tanks. What this was, it was just filled with machine guns. There's a machine gun here, there's a machine gun here, there's two on the other side. And it's a big steel box, so if I'm shooting a machine gun at it, the guys inside are safe and operating their own machine guns. There's about 500 of these tanks employed at this um, Musargon offensive. Airplanes shooting, you know, bombing. This looks like a modern war almost by the end. And with American help, um, the Germans finally start to get pushed back. And by by the end of October, it starts to become a rout. By October of 1918, uh, the Germans are out of food. They are, there's starvation in German cities. They, are, they have no more soldiers. Their reserves are exhausted. Meanwhile, still, every single day, 10,000 new, fresh, big, strong, well-trained Americans are arriving on the front line. The Hindenburg Line at the end of October is pierced. Back in the German capital of Berlin, a liberally minded um, German by the name of Prince Max of Baden announces that the Kaiser is no longer in charge of Germany. That pretty much all by himself, he said, the German government is overthrown. Uh, and nobody in Germany was willing at that point to really fight and die for the Kaiser. Germany asked the United States, not the Allies, Germany asked the United States specifically for a cessation of hostilities. Uh, they asked for an armistice based on Wilson's 14 points. And they said, if we don't get these 14 points, we're going to continue fighting. They said, look, you're not even in Germany yet. 
You're, there's not a single Allied troop on German soil. There's a lot of power still left in the German army. There's going to be a lot of Allied troops killed and wounded if you choose to continue this war. We will stop fighting if we get the 14 points as a basis for peace. The Allies jump on it, and they say, absolutely. And an armistice is signed. Um, and if you would load this up, please look up the armistice train. Uh, uh, the armistice, the yeah, World War One armistice train, which should probably get us the picture we're looking for. Uh, Compiègne is the name of the fort. World War One armistice train. R M I S T S railroad car. There it is. I note that the. The armistice was final, was set up to be signed on November 11th at 11 o'clock in the morning. And it became known, um, it was signed at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Uh, and finally, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, this war that had started four years earlier and had cost the lives of well over 10 million people in Europe, the guns finally fell silent. Um, that was also the armistice of 1918. I need to change. Um, the war was over. The fighting had stopped. The armies kind of looked across this no man's land at each other for the first time in four years without shooting at each other. But now the bigger questions remained. The war was won. Who was going to win the peace? 